it was cardiolipin as antigen. Next slide. And so in 1983, uh, a group, uh, Harris and the others, that's me and Garavi and Hughes, uh, we tried that test, uh, the anti-cardiolipin uh, assay. Next slide, please. And the important finding was we looked at 65 patients and we found that the positive anticoagulation test correlated with thrombosis and patients with thrombocytopenia. So those were the two associated disorders. It was later that the association of anticoagulation with pregnancy loss was also determined. What was also interesting is that of the 32 lupus anticoagulant patients, 29 were anticardiolipin positive. So 29 of the 32 uh, were anticardiolipin positive, showing a relationship between the two tests. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is just an old picture of Princess Diana coming to visit the lab at about that time. We see Graham Hughes backing the camera and there I am uh, speaking with Princess Diana. That's 30 years ago, and there was great excitement uh, around the uh, test and what it would mean. Next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, we went on to look at these antibodies, and we found that if you were to take phospholipid micelles and mix them in the serum with anticardiolipin antibodies, you would remove the anticardiolipin antibodies. We also found that if you, if you coated plates with other negatively charged phospholipids, like phosphatidylserine or phosphatidic acid, the binding to cardiolipin would be, uh, the, the antibodies would also bind these negatively charged phospholipids, and it would correlate with binding to cardiolipin. And so this is how we started using the, the term anti-phospholipid antibodies to mean that they bound many phospholipids. Next slide. Um, and in 1985, uh, there were enough case reports now uh, to suggest that we really had a syndrome. And that's when, uh, for the first time, at least the word antiphospholipid syndrome uh, was used. And you could see the features, thrombosis, thrombocytopenia, and pregnancy loss. And patients could have a lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin, or biological false positive test, or syphilis. Next slide. Well, there was a problem with the anticardiolipin test. It was too sensitive. And many patients with infectious and autoimmune diseases had a positive test. And so there needed to be a way that you could distinguish patients with the syndrome from other patients who were just antibody positive and uh, you know who would not have the syndrome. Next slide, please. And this is what we found. We found that patients with the antiphospholipid syndrome tended to have high levels of the antibody. They tended to have an IgG isotype positive, and the antibody tended to be there for months to years. For patients with infectious diseases, the antibodies would be low, they were often IgM, and they would come and disappear. So knowing, so we, 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 with these three features, we started then deciding how might we better detect these patients. Next slide, please. And so in 1987, uh, we sort of adapted the LISA assay so that the assay would give a level of, it would measure the amount of antibody present, the level of positivity. And the way we did it was to uh, devise some calibrators of differing levels of anticardiolipin antibody. They would form a calibration curve. And so a sample, an unknown sample, uh, we can relate to the calibration curve and we can tell how much antibody was present. And we had calibration curves, both IgG or IgM. So what this meant is we could measure the level of the antibody. And from that, we were able to say, well, uh, this is a high level 
so it's more likely that this patient has the antiphospholipid syndrome. The level helps in better defining the syndrome. Next slide, please. The levels were defined in, in IgG, in what were called GPL units, IgM, in MPL uh, units. And so in 1987, uh, I first proposed, uh, you know, some criteria for the syndrome, which would be patients would have one of the things on the left, which is a clinical feature, any one of them or two of them or all of them, and on the right, they would have at least one of the tests positive, but the test would have to be positive above a certain level. If it was below, if IgGACL was below 20 GPL, it was an uncertain uh, diagnosis. We also stated at that time that the test needed to be positive more than once, eight weeks apart. Again, that would be another feature that would help suggest that it is the syndrome. Next slide, please. Um, two events happened in 1990 that changed the story uh, very much. The first was that uh, researchers found in Australia, uh, in, in Belgium, found that uh, the antibodies actually uh, bound the protein, beta-2 glycoprotein 1, uh, that occurs in human uh, serum. And indeed, uh, if you were to just coat the plates with beta-2 glycoprotein 1 alone, uh, about 70% of the anticardiolipin positive patients would be also anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1. And the anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 positivity uh, was a more specific test. It was less frequently uh, false positive. Um, so in 2006, that anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 uh, was accepted as a, a third test for the for the criteria for the syndrome. So anticardiolipin, lupus anticoagulant, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1. Next slide, please. Uh, there was another event that happened, and this leads us into the particular APHL antibody. I, I found, uh, what we found is that patients' antibodies, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome antibodies, would bind other negatively charged phospholipids. But antibodies from patients with syphilis and infectious diseases didn't bind other phospholipids. They only seemed to bind cardiolipin. And so with the hypothesis that if you mixed or if you use one negative or you mix negatively charged phospholipids, only APS would bind those phospholipids, not uh, syphilis and other autoimmune diseases because all the Syphilis and autoimmune diseases only bind cardiolipin. They didn't seem to bind the negatively charged phospholipid. Next slide, please. So then what I did with uh, Sylvie Pierre and Jelly is that we tried different mixtures of phospholipids and we compared the binding of antiphospholipid syndrome sera and syphilis sera. And what we looked is what mixture of phospholipids would best distinguish. In other words, we wanted to find a mixture where syphilis and other infectious diseases would be negative on the test, only the APS that would be positive. That's what we were trying to do. We are trying to distinguish between, uh, between APS here and other infectious disease and autoimmune uh, here. And this mixture of phospholipids would enable us to do that. Next slide, please. And uh, so, in truth, we came up with a, 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 a test and, and phospholipids that enabled us to distinguish between uh, syphilis and, other, and, and the APS. In other words, APS, uh, uh, the APS antibodies would bind this antigen, um, but the, the syphilis and autoimmune would not bind uh, this antigen, whereas in a cardiolipin test, both bind. Uh, so uh, Sylvia is going to explain this some more. So thank you. Thank you, Nigel. And thank you, everybody, for joining uh, this uh, webinar. And I'm not just now to take on 
from what Nigel said, from the historical point of view on how we move forward with the APHL test and other tests uh, since the early 90s. So we know that uh, tests uh, should be uh, sensitive in order to make an accurate diagnosis of the syndrome and also should be largely confined to patients with a disorder that should be a specific. And in addition, we also have uh, to have tests that are reproducible in most laboratories. With that in mind, um, we, uh, we have to have essential tests that are, why, why tests need to be used to process of the antiphospholipid syndrome because uh, uh, patients with APS have uh, thrombosis and pregnancy losses, and those manifestations can be also present in many other situations related to APL. And then we have to make decisions with respect to management of these patients that require a precise diagnosis. So um, this is what uh, I just say, that prognosis and management are uh, to prevent recurrences of those manifestations depend on the presence of the antiphospholipid antibodies. So based on that observation, we developed the APHL ELISA test. The principle is that, as Nigel said, that we have to have a mixture of phospholipids that are basically binding only APS era, at least to, to you know, improve the specificity and minimize the binding of other infectious diseases, other autoimmune diseases that are not related to the antiphospholipid syndrome. So it minimizes the cross reactivity. So we constructed this kit that we call the APHL ELISA, and this is some of the initial data showing that the kit. Uh, as you can see here, uh, in the cardiolysin assay, a number of infectious diseases bind, uh, give positive results for IgG and for IgM, but in the APHL ELISA, that binding was minimized to very low uh, or negative results. So uh, when we look at APS era, the sensitivity or the binding of the uh, APS era to the APHL ELISA plate compared to cardiolysin was very similar indicating that the sensitivity of the assay was comparable to the anti cardiolipin test. And this is the, one of the early data that was submitted actually for the uh, FDA uh, um, application. There were many studies that were done with this APHL ELISA. Some were done in our laboratory, some were done uh, for other labs, and I'm going to try to show those data to try to convince that the sensitivity and the specificity for this assay uh, is, is very good. Here we have uh, 54 samples that they were tested, APS samples that they were tested in the anti-cardiolipin uh, in-house assay back in the, uh, in the 90s. This is the APHL ELISA and the anti beta 2 gp one The sensitivity of the cardiolipin and the APHL ELISA, they are very similar and uh, reasonable high. Then here we have also a comparison of a, this was done in a web workshop in the, in the Seven International Symposium of Antiphospholipid Antibodies. As you can see here, although the number of samples were not very large, when you compare side by side different assays, including some of the um, uh, anti-cardiolipin assays that are in the market, this was a flow cytometry assay that we had back then, the sensitivity and the specificity of the APHL ELISA kit remains very high. Here, this was a study done in, uh, in Portugal where we have, again, that uh, the uh, specificity of our assay was 100% compared to 79% for the cardiolipin, 82% for the anti beta 2 gp one When we look at in the same study for sensitivities, the cardiolipin was 96.6% 90, and the anti APHL ELISA was 98%. And the sensitivity of the anti beta 2 gp one uh, I think this was uh, using the Innova kit was 74%. The specificity in this other assay using 184 samples of infectious diseases, other autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, the specificity of the assay, the APHL ELISA kit was 99% compared to cardiolipis 60% and compared to the anti-beta 2 GP1 was 82%. Here, this is a study that was done in Brazil where they, uh, they look at samples from infectious diseases such as leishmaniasis, syphilis, 
leptospirosis. And as you can see here, the specificity of the APHA ELISA was 96.3% compared to cardiolipin 73% and 70% for the anti-beta-2. A number of infectious diseases were picked up as positive in the anti-cardiolipin test and surprisingly also in the anti-beta-2 GP1 test. So in another study done by a group here in Houston uh, from the University of Texas Medical Center, they show uh, and publish in Journal of Rheumatology that the APHL ELISA kit provided the best predictive value for pregnancy loss in a large cohort of lupus patients and APS. Uh, this is a study that we did uh, when we were back at Morehouse School of Medicine, where the several centers were uh, participating, including the University of Texas in San Antonio, Dr. Robin Bright, who tested the APHL ELISA test. We tested, uh, we didn't test our kit, just not to be uh, accused of being biased. We checked the anti-cardiolipin and the anti-beta-2 GP1 from INOVA. The University of Milan, Professor Meroni's group, tested uh, the anti-beta-2 and the anti-prothrombin They both were in-house assays. And the participating centers did not know the identity of the samples. And the University of Utah, Dr. Weabrash, was the coordinating center. So we had 56 APS samples tested. 145 controls, and 206 samples from uh, infectious diseases, including syphilis, HIV, and other autoimmune diseases. And, and we look at the, uh, the uh, sensitivity, the specificity, the ROC, uh, I, uh, and then the, po the positive predictive value. As you can see here, combining sensitivity and specificity, the uh, APHL ELISA kit gave, gave us the best predictive value, 89% compared to all this. Um, all this. The anti-beta-2, this assay was pretty good. Uh, the anti-beta-2 GP1 uh, was done at Professor Smeroni's uh, lab. Um, so this is another study that was done uh, in utilizing um, the um, Lumina cohort from the, uh, the group here in Houston and UAB. And we evaluated 588 lupus samples in different assays, the anti-cardiolipin, the anti-beta-2 GP1, and the APHL ELISA. We found that 235 APL positive samples in this cohort of 588 lupus patients, and 118 out of those 235 positive APL samples had clinical manifestations of APL. Uh, being the 39% of the patients had classical manifestations of APS, so they were classified by having the secondary, so-called secondary antiphospholipid syndrome. When we look at the uh, positive predicted values, again, in this lupus cohort, the uh, best uh, was the uh, APHL ELISA with 96.2 PPV compared to the cardiolipin, the anti-beta-2 GP1, and even the lupus anticoagulant. Uh, the, the test was also evaluated in, uh, the, in a wet workshop that we had at the Galveston meeting here in 2010 and was evaluated side by side with other kits and manufacturers, including other new technologies and methodologies. These were all the participating, uh, participating uh, companies and kits. We included ELISA tests. Uh, we included the chemiluminescent test and the uh, multiplex from BioRad as well. When we compare the ELISAs uh, from the different manufacturers, the uh, sensitivity and the specificity of our kit was 100%. They all were good, but the ELISAs, uh, our kit gave 100% both for sensitivity and specificity. All these are FDA clear kits, and as you can see, the, the uh, positive predictive values and clinical sensitivities and specificities were good, but our uh, kit gave the best value. So we can say that our ELISA kit was the best ELISA of, at, at the Congress in Galveston. This is a more recent study that was done at Arup Laboratories uh, that is now using our test. Uh, this uh, test was done by them independently, and we, they used samples that they provided uh, themselves, they evaluated our APHL ELISA against the anti-cardiolipin and the anti-beta-2 from INOVA, which we are currently using for routine testing. They utilized positive APL samples. 
They also use negatives and 50 infectious diseases that included a number of sera with parvovirus and sera from syphilis. And they considered the samples positive when they were above the cutoff. They established the positive predicted value and the negative predicted value. And they also examine other performance characteristics such as precision and interload variation and so on. So what is important for this talk is that uh, when they combine the uh, APHL, IgG, IgM uh, together uh, and with the other, the, the APHL ELISA gave the best positive predictive value and negative predictive value. And this was published, uh, it's already published in the International Journal of Clinical Experimental Pathology. So all in all, this table summarizes all the studies that uh, we and others have done uh, utilizing this kit. As you can see, the hallmark of this kit is the uh, consi consistently more specific for the, uh, uh, for the diagnosis of the antiphospholipid syndrome. And these are specificities for the cardiolipine and for the beta 2 GP1. And, and, and showing that this kit continues to be more specific. Uh, we also, this kit is also um, part of, you know, as part of the CAP proficiency testing. And over the years, I, I, I just look at what has been the performance of this kit. And when we look at the IgG, as you can see, consistently has passed all the proficiency testing of the College of American Pathology. Similar, we have a table up to 2011 from 2004 where the IgM had the best uh, perfect performance in the CAP proficiency testing. Uh, so the features of the APHL ELISA kit is, as Nigel says, is an antigen coated uh, with a mixture of phospholipids and beta 2 GP1. It has six pre-diluted calibrators that they are ready to use, three, uh, at time, three uh, 30 minutes incubation steps, uh, we have the peroxidase and alkaline phosphatase systems available for secondary antibody. All other reagents are ready to use. It can be used for the determination of IgG and IgM antiphospholipid antibodies. It has a 12-month expiration date. Uh, it's good to be used in automated systems and instruments. Um, uh, and then uh, has been cleared by the FDA for in vitro diagnostic use since 1991. And it's also CE marked. So we have six-point calibration course that covers the medium, high, and low positive and negative, and enables the termination of titers of antiphospholipid antibodies. Importantly, this kit utilizes the same GPL and MPL uh, units that are used for cardiolipine tests, and includes also a positive control and a negative control in serum, not pre-diluted, so they can be used as, uh, as to monitor the performance of this kit. Um, the, so far, has been shown to be more, uh, more accurate than the anti-cardiolipine for the diagnosis because it's more specific. It's more specific than the anti-cardiolipine test and at least as specific or more in some cases compared to the anti-beta 2 gp one The best positive predicted value shown in many studies it has a positive control, and we feel that it could be used as a first line of testing because of the sensitivity and the very comparable to the anti-cardiolipine test. So with respect to what we do in Louisville APL, with respect to risk management for this kit, is we do all the time ongoing stability studies over the years to you know, confirm and verify the stability of the product. The CAP survey since 1999, and we've seen some of the data. We also analyze users, um, users runs to make sure that there are no problems, and we do trend analysis using customer complaints and customer surveys. So we think that the APHL, ELISA kit, enables the greatest specificity for APS diagnosis. Uh, the sensitivity is comparable to the anti-cardiolipine test, so we can use as a first line of testing for diagnosis of the antiphospholipid syndrome. We think that this test represents a significant advance in laboratory diagnosis for the APS. These are the publications. I can email it. I mean, this is a list of publications. This is from our group on the left side, and on the right side are independent publications uh, showing uh, the performance of this assay. 
So now I'm going to move and tell you a little bit more about other assays and things that we are doing in our laboratory and we think that is probably important to show. One of the questions that we have uh, these days is whether we should use IgA antiphospholipid antibodies for diagnosis of APS. As you know, IG isolated IgA anti-cardiolipin positivity has been seen in our experience over 20 years in very few cases, in registries uh, of APS patients such as the ASCOR, when evaluating 700 samples, they only found five positive for cardiolipin IgA. We also know that there is a higher prevalence of IgA anti-cardiolipin in Afro-Caribbean population uh, in studies published by, uh, by Aziz Garavi and by Wendell Wilson. And um, we also shown in the mid-90s that in, when you inject IgA antiphospholipid antibodies, whole fraction of IgA in mice, we have shown to be pathogenic in animal models. However, the clinical significance of APL IgA antibodies remains elusive. So recently, we published a, a paper on cases of isolated IgA anti-beta 2GP1 positivity uh, since IgA now anti beta 2 are tested more routinely in the United States, we are seeing more and more cases where patients have only IgA positive. So we were curious to know what happened, you know, what are the clinical manifestations on those patients, whether they are associated uh, uh, with uh, APS or not. In the first published uh, paper we published here, five cases, all of them had lupus, and all of them, as you can see, they were positive for IgA only. And in all five cases, they have some kind of manifestations related to APS. So based on that, then we uh, went ahead and looked at uh, three cohorts of uh, uh, samples. Two were lupus. One is Lumina with 588 samples. And Hopkins and Michelle Petrie gave us three, 215 lupus patients from her cohort. And then we look at... Uh, more than 5,000 samples that we have collected in our laboratory over the years and, and looked at that in the Lumina cohort, we found 23 that were only IgA anti beta 2 positive in the Hopkins 17, and we got uh, 17 also in the APLS. When we look at the manifestations, uh, APS-related manifestations, we found that a significant number of those patients had APS manifestations. This is in the absence of everything else negative, including the lupus anticoagulant. And they were anti-cardiolipid GMNA negative and anti-beta 2GP1 GNM negative. They only had IgA anti-beta 2. So then we thought that maybe this is a kid-related uh, issue. And we look at this, was, this were done with the Innova kit. And then we look at another kit and we found very good, also positive, all of them, and very, uh, the correlation was very good. So we felt that it was a real phenomenon. So then we look at the association of this isolated IgA anti beta 2 positivity with thrombosis. And we found that isolated IgA anti beta 2 positivity was associated with all forms of thrombosis, arterial and venous thrombosis in the three cohorts. And after adjusting for age, at the visit, smoking, obesity, pregnancy, and, and so on, uh, uh, we found that, that the arterial thrombosis association was um, still uh, significant, but the association with venous thrombosis were not statistically significant. So we found that this IgA isolated positivity was associated with arterial thrombosis. So at the uh, uh, APL task force, the non criteria APL task force that was chaired by Dr. Bartolacini in Galveston, uh, there was a recommendation that measurement of IgA anti beta 2 antibodies may enable clinicians to identify additional antibodies, additional patients with clinical suspicion of APS who do not meet the current diagnostic criteria, and it was recommended that testing for IgA antibodies when other antiphospholipid uh, tests are negative and APS is highly suspected should be done. Just a few words on other tests that are coming now uh, and, and they're becoming more popular. We have antibodies to other phospholipids. We have antibodies to antiprotrombin tests, antiphosphatidylserine antibodies, and all the, uh, the anti-domain one ELISAs, 
the annexin A5 resistance, and also antibodies ELISA against anti-annexin A5 and protein C. So with respect to the immunoassays for detection of antibodies to other phospholipids, uh, we know that uh, the patients with APS, uh, most of them will bind to negatively charged phospholipids, that's to say phosphatidylserin, phosphatidylinositol, phosphatidic acid, phosphatidylglycerol, and to some extent to antiphosphatidylethanol. I mean, these four here are the negatively charged phospholipids. This is not news. The problem with these assays is that may, may, these assays are not uh, well standardized. There are no controls or calibrators available in most cases for these assays. And uh, most of the kits available in the market, they are RUO. They are not FDA clear except for the antiphosphatidylserin. Mainly the doctors who order these tests are uh, uh, um, uh, doctors that work with uh, um, um, pregnancy and pregnancy losses, uh, maternal fetal medicine, IVF doctors, and so on. And um, these also assays are not in the proficiency testing of the CAP except for the phosphatidylserine starting this year. So the um, also, the value of this test has been uh, mainly uh, associated with case reports in the literature, and it's not in a really good, good studies, except for the phosphatidyl theory, where you have a few studies showing the association of these antibodies with antiphospholipid syndrome. So uh, this is to summarize that we need to have more uh, rigorous standardization for this test. We need to have larger studies involving various subgroups of APS patients to confirm the validity of this test. We move now to the antiprotromin and antiprotromin for phosphatidylserine antibodies. Uh, the idea was to find initially an association of this, this ELISA, so this test with the lupus anticoagulant, perhaps to see even if this ELISA could replace the lupus anticoagulant, which is a clotting assay, uh, is more tedious and has a number of uh, problems. Uh, the uh, main players here in this assays are Dr. Atsumi, uh, Dr. Forastiero, and Dr. Bertolaccini. These are the major three groups working on this assay. They have published a number of publications. Uh, the APT, APS, but not the antiprotromin seems to be associated with thrombosis in this systematic review published by Dr. Gali. And there is a number of, uh, increasing number of publication and interest and a number of kits that are uh, being um, developed. This is uh, to show that the APSPT uh, basically has, in, in this study published by doctors Atsumi and Koiki, a high specificity, but the sensitivity is not so good. So compared to the lupus anticoagulant and the anti-cardiolipine anti-beta-2. So the conclusions, again, from the task force in Galveston, in a, in a session chaired by Dr. Bertolaccini, uh, indicated that the APSPT should be intensively standardized, that the APSPT should be further investigated as a possible criterion for APS. The test seems to be specific for APS, but not very sensitive. And the value of APSPT as a confirmatory test for lupus anticoagulant deserve further investigation. Uh, we also, they also consider the uh, possibility of using the APT or antiprotrombin uh, tested as a risk marker for APS manifestation. Another test of interest uh, these days is the anti-domain 1 ELISA. This is based on the idea that the anti-beta 2 GP1 antibodies bind to beta 2 GP1 through domain 5 of the protein and then the protein complex with anti-beta 2 GP1 binds to the receptors on endothelial cells or other target cells through domain 1. So apparently, this, uh, and, and studies that uh, we have done, the anti-domain 1 is, 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 you know, is associated with the thrombosis, and others have also shown that if you do a ELISA with anti-domain 1, you detect the most pathogenic antibodies. And these are the studies that I was mentioning. This is the pathogenic effects of antiphospholipid antibodies that can be abrogated in vivo by recombinant domain 1. So if we have just the domain 1, we can abrogate the thrombosis in mice. And these are studies from the group of Basilat, 
where they have shown association of these antibodies to uh, thrombosis, with thrombosis. So apparently this assay could be more, um, uh, more uh, the one that detects the, the thrombogenic antibody. The other assay of interest is the annexin A5 resistant assay. This was developed by Jacob Rahn, where um, he uh, can show that antiphospholipid antibodies displace the annexin 5 from phospholipid surfaces. And in that way, they change the, um, the uh, anticoagulant activity of annexin A5. And they can measure then the um, presence of the antiphospholipid antibodies using a clotting assay, two-step clotting assay. What he claims, Jacob claims, that this is a first mechanistic assay. And they also claim that this annexin A5 resistant assay has been correlated very well with the domain 1 antibodies that uh, the assay that was developed by Barcelona. So just to give a, a word, two or three slides on what has been done with respect to the standardization of antiphospholipid tests from, from, from our group, and there have been a number of efforts from other groups, European, the Australian uh, groups, and so on, over the last 25 years. Uh, the standards the, uh, that for the, the polyclonal standard for anti-cardiolatin were developed by Nigel Harris in 1987. Then the, uh, the group also organized a number of international web workshops, and we also defined the current units for IgA measurement, the APL unit. The, after the, um, the meeting in Galveston in 2010, there was a number of activities that took place. Uh, and as, as a follow-up of the antiphospholipid task forces, uh, we created a committee that worked on the establishment of international consensus units for anti-beta 2GP1, IgG, and IgM. I'm glad, and this was an effort done with Professor Meroni's group. And uh, we have completed a lot of the work on that um, project. The material um, has been evaluated by nine different companies. And we have the results, and it looks very promising. Uh, we have also published a paper in Arthritis and Rheumatism and International Consensus Guidelines, uh, including the group, uh, Professor Meroni, Professor Tincani from Italy, the Australian group, and Americans as well. We are also chairing a committee on CLSI that is going to uh, have soon a consensus protocol for anti-cardiolipine and anti-beta-2 immunoassays. Uh, we are in voting stage, voting stage one, and we also working in the standardization subcommittee on lupus anticoagulant and phospholipid dependent antibodies of the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. We are planning to report all these new, um, uh, all these new um, advances in standardization in the meeting in Rio de Janeiro, and there is also a proposal to consider new tests to be included in the classification criteria, perhaps establish a diagnostic criteria for APN. Uh, this is something about our company. Uh, we have been uh, FDA um, compliant since 1991, and we are also ISO 13485 and CAMCAT for the Canadian medical devices. Um, we have distributors. Uh, Grifos uh, Movaco has been our um, distributor for many years now in countries in Europe and also in Chile, and but we also have distributors in other countries. And uh, we, um, some of them for many years, we have worked with them for many years. This is our website, and thank you so much for your attention. I'm going to open the, um, the microphone for other people if you want to make questions, uh, if you uh, want also questions by email. That will be also fine. Thank you so much for your attention. Are there any questions? We, uh, we saw the IgA kits for the lab. Oh, we, yeah. we stopped it for the lab. And we have a we, We've sold these kits for a long time. Mm -hmm. We've quite a year. 
with your heart and cell. And we changed the name. We used to call it an APL, a live zone. Okay. And nobody knew what that possibly what the live zone was. So uh -huh. a few years ago, we changed the name to, uh, um, I guess it's a high sensitivity or high specificity and a cardiac life okay. and the HSBCL. Mm -hmm. And that's it. I'm sorry, sir. Do you have a question? I hear somebody talking, but I don't know who that is. For all the third party kits that we sell, mm -hmm. um, we as a company, we better than the solid home blocks that we make. Mm -hmm. Because we absorb much more food and make that money. Mm -hmm. So we don't not sell it yet. See, I'm going to truly go out and talk to people. But if I would choose to sell the DVD or DPG in this, yeah. I think that we should know. So, yeah. But she wanted us to sit in on this, so that's why. Hi, Robert. Hi, Robert. No, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. But I don't, I don't see, um, uh, is there any questions? Well, thank you very much for joining. You can always send an uh, email to me or to Nigel if you have any questions about the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.